Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I just want to thank you for taking the time to download and watch this past week's message here at Central. God's doing some amazing things here, and we're praying that God will take His Word and plant it deep within your heart that you would become a greater Christ follower. We just want you to know that God it loves you and that God has a plan for you. But here's what we want you to understand. You need to be involved in a local church. So we don't want you to use this as a replacement, but we want to use this as a supplement to your faith. If you aren't connected to a local church, we would invite you to come here at Central at any of our locations and get plugged in. Remember, you are loved at Central. Have a great day. number seven, James chapter five in verse number seven. Would you stand as we read God's word this morning in James chapter five, verse seven. It's amazing what God has given to us in a passage of scripture this morning. You'll catch it here in a moment. God says under inspiration, be patient therefore brothers unto the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being patient about it until it receives the early and latter rains. You also be patient, establishing your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those, who, those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. You may be seated. Uh, this Tuesday, the world waited uh, it, with bated breath for the advent of Disney+. Plus. I'm sure you were waiting there at 2, uh, 12.01 in the morning for this streaming service that has captured America and the world by storm. It, for months, Disney had been uh, building up the, the November 12th start date in which all of the Disney movies, all the Marvel movies, all the movies in the vault would be open and available to anyone who would pay $6.99 a month or as a customer of Verizon. You get it for free. And those of you who didn't know that, you're welcome. <laughs> and that morning... As people were primed and ready to turn on that streaming service and watch The Little Mermaid, they saw the words unable to connect to Disney Plus. <laughs> Social media was ablazing. People were upset. People were aggravated. The promises that were made by Disney seemed to be a mirage. At 9.59 a.m., they put out a tweet that said the demand for Disney Plus has exceeded our highest expectations. We are so pleased you're excited to watch all your favorites and are working quickly to resolve any current issues. Notice, we appreciate your patience. And they received thousands of upon thousands of negative comments, such of which would make a sailor blush. People were frustrated. And what this reminded me of is that we live in a culture where patience is not seen as either a value 
or a virtue. We live in the most impatient culture in the history of humanity. We have the least ability to be patient. And being in this impatient culture, you see the reverberations of it in how we spend our money and how we spend our time. Our consumeristic capitalism affirms this impatience like no other. Think about it when and it comes in regards of buying things. We, we have a, a, a service called Amazon Prime in which you in one click can purchase almost anything your heart desires. And not only can you do it in one click, but you can get it to your house in two days or the next day or sometimes the same day. And eventually there is going to be somebody that is as soon as you say it and as soon as you click it, they ding the doorbell and it's delivered to you. Think about it in communication. You can tweet in a matter of seconds. You can text. You can send a message. You can send an email. Most people today do not spend their hours talking on the phone. They spend hours tweeting and texting and emailing. Think about it in the food world where, where we want everything to be microwave and instant grits. We have fast food. And, and not only do when you go to a fast food place, like say you go to Chick-fil-A, and at most Chick-fil-A's, they don't only have one line, they have two lines. And you can mobile order and just show up and it's there. We now have a society where everything is about speed. Everything is about fast passes. Everything is about instant gratification. And the result of that is that our society, unlike any other in history, is far less capable to handle suffering than any other culture, any other society in history. We're unable to handle when things are not easy. We're unable to handle when things are not quick. We are unable to handle when things don't work the way they're supposed to work. And what we do is that we melt down or we give up because it's not quick and easy. Well, this morning, James has a word for all of us, not some of us. It is said this, that patience is a virtue. Get it if you can. Found seldom in a woman and never in a man. The theme of James is functional faith. And for James, it is more than just saying you're a Christian. It is showing that you are a Christian in practical, everyday ways. And James here is pastoring a people who are going through immense suffering. They are exploited and oppressed by the rich and the cultural elites of their days. Last week we saw in verses 1 through 6 that James reminds us that there is a day of judgment that is coming. Those who are exploiting you, those who are, uh, who are hurting you, uh, they will have a day in which God is going to make everything right. God hears your cries. He cares for you. There is hope. And now on the heels of this, he calls the entire church, all of us this morning, to patience. And he did this in the beginning of the book where he said, consider it joy, my brothers, when you come, when you encounter uh, trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete. So now is as if he's in full circle as he's closing his book to these scattered, exploited people, this call to patience. So three things we want to look at this morning, and I pray that God, by his power, will give us all the ability to comprehend with all the saints what God wants for us this morning. The first thing I want you to see is the command for patience. He says in verse 7, be patient. That's not a suggestion. It is a command. Be patient, therefore, brothers. He is connecting verses 1 through 6 to what his command is in verse number 7 through this little word, therefore. The word, therefore, points to the past and tells us that this is now how we are to live in light of what we have just read in the past. That he's saying that considering the exploitation, oppression, and frustration you are facing, the proper response of faith is patience. So he's addressing believers. Here he uses the word brothers again. He's addressing believers. And he says, my brothers have patience. And he uses this word patience in illustration form, but also he uses two Greek words to describe what he is getting at here in this command on be patient. The first word he will use in verses 7, verse 8, and verse 10, it's a Greek word, markothumia. And the word literally means long-suffering. 
Eugene Peterson, in his uh, paraphrase of the scriptures in the book, The Message, calls long-suffering, long obedience in the same direction. From this Greek word, markothemia, we get our word thermos. Now, I know that as Floridians, we probably don't, a lot of you don't have a lot of thermoses, but maybe some of you have thermoses. A day like today would be a great day to have a thermos. But I have, I've been out in the woods when I was a younger, younger lad, and we would go out uh, and, and do certain things. Never would camp. I, I don't, I hate camping. But but we would go out hunting, and we would go out doing uh, fishing in the morning, and, and it would be kind of chilly, so we would have a thermos of hot chocolate or a thermos of coffee or whatever. And what a thermos does is this. A thermos does not allow the elements on the outside to affect the contents on the inside. That's what a thermos does. It keeps the elements from the outside to affect the contents, what's on the inside. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying uh, someone is long-suffering is someone who has the ability to suffer long, long obedience in the same direction. The outside things do not affect the inside of the person. But then he uses another Greek word. This Greek word is found in verse number 11. It's translated steadfastness. And this word steadfastness can also be translated endurance or perseverance. It is someone who is not going to back down, but is someone who will remain strong under immense pressure. They are immovable. As one translated it, they are the standing man. So here he is saying, those of you who are going through suffering, those of you who are going through frustrating times, be patient, be long-suffering. Don't allow what's on the outside to affect you on the inside. And be steadfast, be immovable, stay the course, be the standing man. Tim Keller defines patience this way. He says that patience is graciousness and steadiness in the face of delayed gratification or disappointments in life. It is the inner conviction that no matter what is going on outside, God is in control and God is good. So here he says, be patient, therefore, my brothers, or be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. This call for patience is not an indefinite call. It's not just to have patience forever and all eternity. He is saying here, have patience with the end in sight. For two millennia, the heart and the imagination of every believer has been set on the return of Christ and our complete liberation from sin, suffering, and Satan. And so here he is saying, you are not just to be patient forever. There is an end to your suffering. And it is a defined cataclysmic global event, the coming of the Lord. And what he wants you to understand is that you, my brothers, you, my sisters, are to be patient until this comes. But our suffering has an end date. Our oppressors will be judged, and our Savior will return, and he will rescue us. For the Christian, history is linear. We are not moving away from something, but we're moving towards someone, and that someone is Jesus Christ. What we are moving towards is the return of the king. Because ever since the ascension of Jesus from the dead, and ever since his ascension on the Mount of Olives, believers have anticipated his return. Although they didn't know when, they always believed that it would be soon. Because the Christian hope hinges on the second coming of Christ. So as we think of our glorious future in Christ, we keep what's going on on the outside from affecting what we are feeling and thinking on the inside. And we keep on keeping on until he returns. So James is saying, listen, don't just have patience for patience sake. Have patience because there there is an end that is coming. So that is the command. Be patient. Now, let's think not only the command of patience, but I want you to see the categories of patience he's talking about. How do we are to be patient? In what areas? Well, the first is the area of life. We're to be patient in life. He uses verse number 7, and he says this, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. Here James is speaking to a group of people who understood farming. Maybe you're not very familiar with farming. Maybe some of you are very familiar with farming. But those that were understanding of farming, and those of you that are understanding of farming, understand that to be a farmer means you have to be patient. Patience is not optional for a farmer. Patience is required. It is a part of the job description. And the reason why you have to be patient is because in James's day, all the farmer could do was prepare his field, sow the seed, 
and then wait for the crop to come. The farmer could do very little to manipulate the crop. That he could do very little to do anything to make it faster. All he could do is just pray and hope for the rain to come at the right time. Now in Israel, in ancient Palestine, the farmer depended on the rain that was in the late fall or the early spring. But even the rain itself is beyond the farmer's control. There's nothing the farmer could do to accelerate the process. All they could do is wait patiently and keep the weeds out of the field. See, that's all he's saying in life. He said, we're like the farmer. That we're like the farmer who we, uh, while we are living our lives, we are waiting for God to move. That there are so many things that are outside of our control, but yet we ultimately know that God is in control. See, the farmer trusted and waited on the promises of God. One of the promises of God that, that God made to his people Israel was in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. will not be on the screen. In which God says that if you will indeed obey my commandments, that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give you rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain your wine and your oil. So what, what James's understanding is that what the Israelites understood when James was writing to them, these, these ancient uh, agrarian, this ancient agrarian culture, they understood that there was nothing they could do to make the rain come other than trust God and be faithful to God and wait for God's good providence to come. So James says that's the same for you. You cannot make Christ's return come any quicker. You cannot manipulate your life in any way to bring about the ends that you necessarily see. You are just called to be patient. So he says in verse number 8, you also be patient, establish your hearts. That just as the farmer waited, he doesn't just wait passively. The farmer waited actively. He actively waited by keeping the weeds out of the garden. And so for us, as we are to remain patient, waiting for God's promises to come true, we are to establish our hearts. We are to not let our hearts be controlled by the circumstances or the situations of this life, but we need to have our hearts strengthened in and by the promises of God. So you have to work. He says in this verse, he says, you also be patient, establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. The promise that we have is that God's coming, the Lord's return is at hand, it is near. Now for 2,000 years people have been saying Jesus is coming back. And I don't know about you, but as a young person, I've always heard people say Jesus is coming back, Jesus is coming back. And you begin to wonder, well is he ever going to come back? And the Bible says here that his return is at hand, that is it is very near. So what does this mean? Well, here's one thing I want you to understand. That Jesus' return is nearer now than it was yesterday. And right now, there is nothing that stands in the way for him to return. So what James is saying is that the reason that we can stand firm, the reason that we can have our hearts established is the nearness of his return. And so we wait. And while we are waiting, God is working in and through us to conform us into the image of Jesus. While we're waiting in life, waiting for what God is going to do, we see God moving in our lives through the trials, through the suffering, through the, the times of drought when we wonder, is God ever going to send the rain? And what God does in this time of waiting is he destroys the idols of our lives and he tears down the things that we are putting our confidence in other than him and he builds our confidence in him and his promises so that whatever he allows to come into our life, we understand that the only option that we have is to trust him and his promises. So he says be patient in life, like the farmer is patient, waiting for the precious fruit to come. You be patient. You wait on the Lord. Again, that's anti antithetical to our culture. We want to make it quick, and we want to make it quick now. But James says, no, you need to be patient until the coming of the Lord. Establish your heart in the promises of God. You know, one of the reasons that a lot of us struggle with impatience is because we don't know the promises of God. Here he says, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Establish your heart in the fact that God will do what he says he's going to do. So be patient in life. And number two, be patient with people. Verse number nine. He says, do not grumble against one another. Some people have a PhD in grumbling. 
Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. What do we often do when we're going through difficult situations? We gripe. We complain. We criticize. We assert ourselves. And here James says, don't dwell on those things where people have wronged you or things have gotten on your nerves. In our culture, if someone offends you, the natural inclination that we have is either one of two things. Either A, we go tell that person off, or B, and this is probably what most people do, is we get angry, we get upset, and we just gripe about them behind their back. That's the Baptist way. right? James tells us to be patient with other people. Why? Number one, we're not that awesome. All of us have shortcomings. All of us have flaws. Everyone in this room is messed up. I mean, you can look at your neighbor and say right now, you're messed up. We all sin. We all make mistakes. And do you realize that God has shown everyone in this room a lot of patience? I'm glad he's shown a lot of patience. So we're to be patient with other people. Why? Because God's been very patient with us. But number two, the judge is standing at the door. You are judging other people, but you don't realize that the true judge is standing there listening to you. I heard a pastor tell a story about his son. And um, he came in on his son, he heard his son berating his, his, his mom, which is this guy's wife. And he was just giving her the what for, telling her all the things he didn't like, and he, he eventually said, Mom, you're a fool. And he didn't realize that his dad was home. And he didn't realize that his dad heard the entire conversation. And as soon as this young man called his mother a fool, the dad walks in and says, son, who's the fool? The son looks at his dad and said, I'm the fool. See, do you realize God hears everything you say about other people? You think about that. That should scare a lot of us to death. See, when you realize that the judge, the one who knows every side and knows the truth, when we realize that he is at the door, it means that he hears us and that at any moment he can open the door and turn on us. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 18, the parable of a man who was forgiven a big debt. This debt was so big, it would take lifetimes for this man to repay it. And this man came to this king and he begged forgiveness. Please forgive me my debt. And the king forgave the man his debt. An astronomical number. But then this man, as he was released on his way down the road, saw another guy that owed him five bucks. And he says, hey, dude, you owe me five bucks. And the guy says, man, I can't afford to pay this. I can't afford to do this. And the guy said, all right, you put him in jail until he pays me my five bucks. And guess who heard about that story? The king who forgave that debt. And the king who forgave that debt brought that man in. And he says, hey, dude. So that's in the Allen version there. Hey, dude. Didn't I just forgive you all this? And here's a man that has wronged you in a very little way and you won't forgive him. You're going to jail. Do you realize that, see, God has forgiven us so much? And in and, and the times where we're suffering and the times where we're upset, it is easy to grumble against people. But we have to understand that God has forgiven us so much, therefore we are to extend mercy to other people. The Bible says this, that above all, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. There are just some times in your life you don't have to tell the other person what they did wrong. You don't have to rub it in their face. Sometimes you just love them and you overlook it. Don't grumble. Be patient. Be patient in life like a farmer's patient waiting for the crops to come. You be patient waiting on the provision of God. Be patient with other people realizing you're not that awesome. And that God is awesome. <laughs> and he's at the door and he hears every word you say. But here's the last one. Be patient in suffering. He says in verse number 10, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. 
The kind of suffering he's talking here is not an ingrown toenail type of suffering. He's talking not about a slight by someone else or some disappointment. He's talking about real suffering. Some of the things that we bemoan is not really that bad of suffering compared to the rest of the world or others that we know. Here he's talking about real losses, real grief, and real pain. And he says, listen, you want an example of life, look at the prophets. These are men who spoke the word of God in the name of God and they were opposed for it. They served the Lord and they did not, they did not exempt themselves and they were not exempt from suffering. He doesn't particularly identify one prophet. He just says, just take the prophets because essentially this is true of all the prophets. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see that, yes, many of these great men of God and great women of God did great mighty things of God, but many of them suffered great things for God. People like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and Amos and Zechariah and Jeremiah all are examples of suffering and patience. I would encourage you, if you're going through a difficult season, read about the prophets. He says in verse 11, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. It goes back and echoes what he says in chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who, when he has went through trials, remains steadfast. He says, blessed is the one who remains steadfast. We consider the prophets, those who stood the test of time, those who continue to preach the word of God despite the oppression, despite the suffering, despite the pain, we consider them blessed. Why? Because they remained steadfast. They were immovable. They were standing men and women of God. Doug Moo on this passage says to be blessed is not, of course, the same as being happy. Happiness normally suggests a subject, emotional reaction. Blessing is the objective, unalterable approval and reward of God. That we have, they, they were blessed. That they remained and went through difficult situations and, and we consider them blessed because we know that God was using them through their suffering. You know, another way that you can be inspired in life is by reading those who have suffered greatly in church history. You know, we, we have, sadly, it's, it's not very exciting for many people to learn history. People, a lot of people don't like history. They don't like to learn about history. They don't like to hear, learn about historical people. But there are some great people in church history that have done great and mighty things and suffered great and great ways, and yet they are. we look at them and say, wow, what a blessing they are. Do you realize if it wasn't for men and women before us standing and proclaiming the word of God despite the suffering, despite the pain, you and I would not be here today. Let me give you an example of one great person of church history. His name is John Bunyan. John Bunyan was born in 1638. He was radically converted later in, uh, as, a, as a younger man in his early 20s. And God called him into ministry and he became a preacher. He was married and his first wife, uh, after they had had their fourth child, died. They had four children, and one of the, the last child was blind. John Bunyan soon would remarry, and, and during about 1660, um, there was a proclamation in England that unless you were a certain kind of Anglican preacher, you were not allowed, unless you were a specific kind of licensed preacher, you were not allowed to preach the gospel. John Bunyan was not a specific kind of uh, preacher that the, the Church of England wanted at that time. And John Bunyan, who would just go out and preach the gospel to anyone and everywhere, he was told this, if you preach the gospel, you'll go to jail. So what did John Bunyan do? He continued to preach the gospel. He was arrested and put into prison. And he just married a young lady by the name of Elizabeth. And, and they had been married just a few months. And, and, and she was pregnant with, with their first child in this new marriage. And upon hearing the news of John Bunyan's arrest, she went into early labor and the child died. John Bunyan would spend 12 years in prison. Do you know all he had to do to get out of prison? Here's all he had to do to get out of prison is to say, I'll never preach again. If you read the, the, the letters that he wrote to his wife, Elizabeth, you know, one of the things that's remarkable is we, we tend to a lot of times in church history remark about how great the, the faith of the men were, but his wife's faith was just as equally great. Because all, the, all he had to do was say, no, I'm going to stop preaching the gospel, and I can go home and be with my children. 
And here is this woman, Elizabeth, who had four children that were not her own, and one of them was blind. And they lived in utter destitution, living essentially on the charity of other believers who loved them. And yet she said, I would never stop him from preaching the gospel, despite it all. And for 12 years, John Bunyan lived in that prison with patience until finally in 1672, there was a change in the law, praise God, and he was able to be let, let go. But in his imprisonment, those 12 years, he wrote 12 books, one of which is the book called Pilgrim's Progress, which is the world's best-selling book translated in 200 languages. And he, like the Old Testament prophets, never stopped preaching. See, many of us, when we're going through suffering, we need examples. We need to hear from people who have gone through things. And, and here, James says, listen, do you need an example of what to do? Look at the prophets. Look at the people of old who lived their lives by faith, clinging to the promises of God, waiting for the coming of Christ. And they were patient in life. And they were patient with each other. And they were patient in their suffering. Let me give you the last point. And that's the cultivation of patience. And here he gives us, I think, probably the great example that many people are aware of when it comes to this whole idea of patience. He says this in verse 11. He says, for we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. And he says, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Probably many of you have heard the story of Job. If you're new to church, maybe you've never heard the, the story of Job, Job. And maybe as you read the Bible, you think it's a guy named Job. No, his name is Job. And Job was a wealthy man, a rich man. He served God. He was a godly man. He was a good guy. But yet he lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his fortune, he lost his health, he lost his wife, his friends came and stared at him for three days. And then finally, after those three days, they accused him of his sin. They said, the reason, Job, you're in the condition you're in is because you are a, a wicked sinner and you need to repent. And Job sat there, not having a clue what's going on behind the scenes, because what we know is going on behind the scenes is God said, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, listen, the only reason he's serving you is because you bless him. You don't bless him anymore, and he'll curse you to your face. And God says, well, you can do whatever you want, except don't kill him. And Satan did whatever he did. And as we read the text, we see that Job here sat in his own filth, sat in his own misery, lived in the pain and the hurt of his physical condition, and his wife looked at him, and her last words to him were, listen, Job, curse God and die. And what does Job say? He says, naked I came from my, from my mother's womb, naked I will return. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And as you read the book of Job at the very beginning, it seems like he starts great. But as you continue through the book of Job, it seems to go downhill. Because in the beginning, when Job goes through the crisis, he's saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. But as you continue reading the book, you don't see him necessarily being the greatest example of patience. Because all throughout the book, when you get past chapters 3 and 4, you see that Job begins to start complaining. He starts crying. He starts whining. He gets angry. He starts questioning God. He starts doubting God, demanding from God, and is very confused about God. He doesn't seem like a great example of patience. Because if patience is essentially what we said earlier, is that you don't let things on the outside affect you on the inside, well, Job seemed to be all shook up. What makes him such a great example? Here's what makes him a, a great example. Listen to this. This is going to help some of you this morning. Is that yes, he complained, and yes, he cried, and yes, he whined, and yes, he questioned, and yes, he doubted, and yes, at times he demanded. But he did all those things towards God. He never stopped praying. He never stopped. It's okay. It's okay. To be honest with God. See, I want you to see three things in his life, in, Job, in Job's life that helped him with the cultivate patience. Number one, he processed his pain through prayer. He never gave up on God. He never got so self-centered that he stopped talking to God or lived as if God didn't matter. He kept pressing in on God even though he didn't understand. And some of you this morning, 
You hear about Job and you hear what he did. And listen, he never stopped talking to God. He expressed his pain. He expressed his problems. He expressed his confusion. And listen, it is easy when we go through tough situations to get so frustrated and so aggravated that we just say, God, I'm done with you. And we stop talking to God. That's the worst thing you could ever do. Because when you get frustrated, you don't stop talking to God. You should talk to God more. Tell him your frustrations. Tell him your aggravations. Tell him your disappointments. What parent in this room, when their children are hurting, would not want their kids to come and tell them all their problems? Even if you don't feel like it, tell it to Jesus. Whatever you're going through, tell it to Jesus. He cares. He understands. He hears. That's what Job did. But number two, he believed that his trials were going to grow him personally. See, he not only processed his pain in prayer to God, but he believed that, that these trials were going to make him different. They were going to grow him. Notice what he says in chapter 23. He says, Behold, I go forward, but there's no one there. And backward, but I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the to the right, but I do not see him. Joseph says, listen, I, I'm looking for God. I don't know where he's at. I've been looking for him. But he knows the way that I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Joseph says, listen, even though I have no clue what God is up to or where God is, I know that God knows where I am. And I, got, and I know that God knows what I am feeling and I am going through. And he is going to do something that is greater than I can imagine. Even though I can't understand him, I know he understands me. And when this sucker is over, it's going to be great. See, this is the theme of the book of James. He says, let patience have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Listen, troubles in your life are an opportunity. You don't rejoice for your problems, but you can rejoice in your problems. Because they grow you to be the kind of person that God wants you to be. And here's what I've learned in my short life. You will never get patience without a problem. Now let me give you the last thing about Job. Is he experienced the compassion and mercy of God. He processed his pain through prayer. He, he knew in his heart that God was going to grow him through these trials. And he experienced the grace of God. At the end of the book of Job, chapter 42, Job repents. Because he understands that he has a limited perspective. He didn't know as nearly as much as he thought he did. And he humbles himself. And he experiences the grace of God in his life. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting better than you deserve. And here Job experienced the compassion and grace of God. Because Job's suffering wasn't the end of Job's story. God gave to Job two times more than he had before. And he lived many days on the face of the earth. Now you say, well, that's great. Job could be patient because he knew what was coming. But if you read the book of Job, he didn't know things would get better. He had no guarantee. Nobody told this. Disney wasn't around then. Nobody told them that things would be happily ever after. He didn't have a clue that he would get his health back. He didn't have a clue he would get his wealth back. He didn't have a clue he would get a new family. But what did he do? He stayed Steadfast. He was the standing man. And experienced the grace and mercy of his life. His life. James' purpose for telling us about Job is to point us to the fact that like Job, our suffering is not the end. The God that was compassionate and merciful to Job is the same God who will be compassionate and merciful to you. Do you realize that if you are a Christian, you have something far greater than Job had? You have a guarantee that Job didn't have. You know, you know that something that is coming is far better than you could ever imagine. 
that our suffering is going to end. It is not the end of our story. That our hope is rooted in the promise of the second coming of Jesus Christ and that God is going to make everything sad in our lives untrue. How is that possible? By the gracious, compassionate mercy of God. Because God has been gracious in his patience towards us. Do you realize how patient God has been with us and how patient he has been for us? This morning I read in my devotion time Hebrews chapter 12 where the writer says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That word endured is hupomeno, the same word steadfastness, the standing man. Jesus was the standing man. See, the story of ultimate patience is the patience of Jesus. Do you realize that they beat Jesus? They jeered at Jesus, they mocked Jesus, and he stood there. He didn't grumble. He didn't complain. He is the ultimate standing man. He didn't blow up. As a matter of fact, on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. Here's the question. Why was he so patient? Why was Jesus on the cross? Do you realize that Jesus could have sent down the mighty forces of heaven to destroy everyone for all eternity and obliterate them in hell forever? Why was Jesus patient for you and for me? He saved us through his infinite patience. And because he is patient for us, God the Father is infinitely patient with us. Despite our flaws, despite our sin, and despite our failures. And that's why the reason that we can trust him is because of what he's done for us. That we can be patient for him. Listen, we can be patient for him because he has been patient with us. Now, I know this morning this is an exciting sermon for some of you. You say, Pastor... I don't like sermons on patience because I may feel guilty and might want to ask God to give me patience and then I'm afraid I'm going to suffer. Because you can't get patience without a problem. Listen, if you live long enough, you're going to suffer. You're going to have problems. The call to this morning is this. is Listen, what James is wanting us to do is he's wanting us to work from the end. He wants us to work from the end to produce patience in the present. He wants you to see this morning, if you're a believer, that the, the suffering in your life is not going to go on forever. There's gonna be, have you ever just had a day like you wish the day would end? You wish the month would end? And maybe some of you this morning, you've allowed things in your mind to think you wish you would end? James here saying, listen, you don't need to end. Your suffering is not the end. There's an end that's coming. And he wants us to draw our attention away from the present circumstances and suffering to point us to the end. You see this all throughout the text. In the very beginning, verse 7, the second coming of the Lord, which is at the end of time. The farmer waits for the precious fruit. When? At the end of the harvest. The prophets who were in the end considered blessed. And Job was blessed at the end of his suffering. It's about the end. Let me end with this. I told you about Disney Plus. Well, we finally got it. We got it. I wasn't one of the people that cussed on Twitter. (laughs) We got it because we have Verizon and we got it for free. So we finally got I waited the next day to get it to see if it would work. And we did. And I I surprised my daughter Anna with it in the morning. I said, hey, Anna, she's always wanted to watch The Little Mermaid. She's went to Disney and seen, you know, went through the rides, but have never seen completely The Little Mermaid. And so I surprised her with it. And um, I said, hey, I got a surprise for you. We got Disney Plus and you can watch The Little Mermaid. So there we were. She was in there. It was early in the morning and she was watching it. And I didn't get to watch the whole thing with her. But there she was and in, in watching that movie and it got to Ursula. Like she just loves Ariel. And it got to Ursula and, and it got to Fultzum and Jetsum. And she started to get scared. And have you ever watched a movie where you just get into the movie and you just like, you're right there with them? Like, I don't know about you. I do. Cart- I mean, I get right there with them. And she was scared. And the reason that she was scared is because she hadn't seen the end of the movie. But I had seen the end of the movie. 
Now, what I'm about to say is a spoiler, spoiler alert. If you've not seen The Little Mermaid, run out of the room right now screaming. At the end of the movie, Ariel and Prince Eric get married. <laughs> Ursula is defeated. And everyone lives happily ever after. Just want you to know that. So happily ever after, they made a little mermaid too. But because I've seen the end of the movie, I didn't get upset. I knew how it was going to play out. I could just enjoy the show. Because I know there's a happily ever after coming. Christian, listen. This sermon may not have given you much. But here's what I hope it gives you. I hope this is what you leave with. If you leave with nothing else, leave with this. If you're a Christian, we've seen the end of this movie, of your life. And it's a glorious ending. Jesus Christ paid for that ending on the cross. And he guarantees it. The end of your life is not your suffering. The end of your life, if you are a Christian, is an eternity with Him. There's nothing greater. All the pains and the problems of your present need to fade and melt away knowing that the end is better. Thanks again for listening to this past week's message and we pray that God blesses His Word in your life. If you'd like to have more information about Central, you can go to centralsanford.net and we pray that you have a great week of worship And we hope to see you next time. Have a great day. God bless.